So I was absolutely delighted to be invited to the meeting. What a, what a fantastic meeting all the way and come all the way from the land of castles and dragons <laughs> to talk to you today. Um, on this first slide is in fact where we have our All Wales Immune Deficiency Patients Day, which is in um, the Millennium Centre. I'll not attempt to read the Welsh, but the English is there and it says, in these stones horizons sing. And if you look at those letters, some of the kids that come to the meeting can actually sit inside those letters inside the building. Mm. Cool. In America, about 4% of the names are Welsh, actually, and quite a few of your presidents. So I'm hoping we've got a, got a link going here. <laughs> so my disclosures. And then what I wanted to do, uh, and I'm going to break this up into a couple of different sections, is talk about the presentations but at the same time, um, consider with you also why these are so difficult. What, what makes these difficult to diagnose? And you heard from Charlotte already that um, 1,400, 2,000, maybe adding up the Facebook sites, but a predicted 14,000. So there's a gap between the people that are here in this wonderful meeting and the people that have, in a sense, not been discovered yet. And so I was thinking about the things that make it more difficult, and I was going to try to present you an extraordinarily easy way, I think, to try to find more people that are out there. Uh, following that, I was going to mention some treatments and specifically concentrate on immunoglobulin, antibiotics, and vaccinations. We're both going to talk about complications and then one or two ideas about monitoring so it's been presented earlier today by Troy as well. There's been an absolute explosion in our knowledge and the number of immune deficiencies. And uh, this is on this slide from 97, 60, 99, 71, and now over 300 different immune deficiencies. And I'm going to reflect my bias, which is to some extent CVID. And that's a, the largest single proportion of that. And if you like, why can we not see the big ship? It looks really obvious there. Why can we not pick this? And one of the questions I was going to put to you just at the beginning to think about as I talk you through some of the presentations is, is it in fact more difficult to think of CVID or is it more difficult to diagnose it? You don't have to answer that. We'll see uh, how things progress. So. In terms of diagnostic difficulties, age of onset, you've heard something about that, but actually in reality, um, you probably can't <coughs> diagnose it under the age of four, but you can diagnose it up to the age of, well, what age? 100, 90? Maybe. Your entire lifespan. That makes it difficult for other doctors who think you had to have this as a baby. You do not. It's common for us, but it's rare for others. Infections are very common, of course, but they affect lots of different parts of the body. So you can see here, you might pitch up to respiratory medicine, ENT medicine, dermatology, um, lots of other settings. So already a number of doctors are involved whose main job is not looking after CVID. Into that mix, throw some autoimmunity. So here, you're going to start pitching up again to dermatology, maybe to gastroenterology, maybe to hematology, maybe to rheumatology. Do all these doctors know about this? So suddenly, you've got these challenges that are standing in the way of getting to what underlies the issues. And granulomas and inflammation, I'll touch on a little bit later. So on this cartoon, um, it divides up, if you like, the infections, which is what I think perhaps is expected by other specialties on this side, and then these perhaps more complicating aspects. And I think it's important to consider initially what, what are antibodies for, really? What are they good at? And one of the things that they're good at is protecting us where we meet the outside world. And we've touched on that in a sense with the lungs, 
the sinuses, the eyes, the ears, places where we see the outside world. So presentations, for example, like chest infections, pneumonias, and here are some of the risk factors which might make those more likely in the setting of CVID. Here we have um, one of the laboratory tests, which is class-switched memory, which is teasing out a subset of those B cells to see if it will help guide our treatment. But sinuses, scarring in the lungs, and of course, optimizing immunoglobulin. So here, these rather charming and appealing <laughs> chaps uh, looking out at you, and I mean, to some extent, you have to give dogs the benefit of the doubt. They do have emotions. You know, this chap here, he wasn't even there when it happened. This chap, absolutely guilty. The ears are gone. And he's trying just not to be there at all. But the message is actually thinking about where we meet the outside world. And it's right from the nose all the way down into the lungs. It's the whole airway. It's not just the lungs. It's not just pneumonia. And so we need to consider both of those aspects. In terms of the sinuses, this is a real challenge for us. This is a lovely paper from Elena Kanalainen in Turku in Finland a little while back. And she looked at people who had essentially no obvious symptoms and asked the question, if I scan and check microbiology, what do I find? Well, she found a lot of sinusitis that was even silent or silent to the medical attendants with bacteria and viruses in there. So again, this consideration of the whole airway starting here and all the way down. Again, from the same, uh, from Peltola, uh, and that's uh, in Finland as well, looking at for example, if you were to get a common cold, and this would be the curve of how you get rid of it, days along here, but if you have hypogamma, it takes a lot, lot longer. And if you had a cold that lasted a hundred and whatever days here, you would only need three colds to have a cold all year. So that brings me on to thinking about if we understand what we're good at, well, immunoglobulin is good. It's really good. And it's very good at preventing pneumonias. And you can see here from the, in fact, Mount Sinai cohort, the decline in pneumonias over time. However, the upper respiratory tract is where we have work to do, I think. And we have to concentrate and think about the limits of what our current treatment is to explore what we might do in the future. This, uh, this slide is, of course, rather harsh because immunoglobulin is doing a very great deal of good. Thinking about autoimmunity. So this is a, a gentleman who came into a um, clinic in Wales and nothing came back on the swabs of his tongue. And we thought, mm, this is a bit odd. And eventually it clicked that, in fact, what the problem was here, this is a it's a rather sore tongue, was that he had pernicious anemia and he had low levels of B12 and that's an autoimmune disease and in fact it's very easy to treat. So once some B12 was given, that all melted away. But again, if you think about autoimmunity and B12 deficiency, that's very common and you might present to a number of specialists or even primary care, but the link to make it back to the underlying cause is often lost. So I'm going to just touch now on, is there an easy way we can find people so that they can be plugged into all of these um, new and improved treatments? And thinking about screening. So we have some wonderful screening methods that are available. Um, Shamefully, not in the UK yet, but certainly in the United States, um, you're able to screen for severe combined immune deficiency with um, track and crack on Guthrie spots on children's heel prick tests. We always hunt in the lab and ask, could that low IgE and lots of asthma admissions actually be a wider immune deficiency? 
and similarly for IGA, and of course education. But Trek and Crack are brilliant at picking things up when you are a baby. But what we see here is a disorder that can happen from four years to a hundred. So we need something else. And I'm going to put to you to see what you think of the idea of calculated globulin. And I've put up here chocolate rice krispies. <laughs> partly because they're so delicious, but partly <coughs> because in fact the recipe is so devastatingly simple. Anyone can make a really nice, it's, in fact it's not really a recipe, it's easier than that. And that's like calculated globulin, which is a simple calculation of total protein minus albumin gives you calculated globulin, of which globulin is a major proportion, and globulin is antibodies. And this is done on virtually every liver function test. In Wales, that's about 2 million a year for a population of 3 million. And so this was used before to find out if it was very high, if you might have myeloma, something like that. So we looked to see if it would find antibody deficiency if we defined a lower limit cutoff. And we've now inserted into the software a comment to prompt primary care and other doctors to think about antibody deficiency. So if you think of why it might be high, well, it's all of the causes that make antibodies high. So hematological malignancy, sarcoidosis, connective tissue disease. But we're more interested in the why would it be low? Primary and secondary antibody deficiency, major uh, potential causes, fluid shifts, and sometimes small paraproteins. Now that's a, like a form of uh, hematological malignancy. So we did a study and looked at about 800 low samples and simply performed immunoglobulins on all of those. And we found that about 87% had a G of less than 6 in the UK, or 600 in the US, and 56% had a G of less than 4, or 400, which was the cutoff that Charlotte mentioned earlier. So 56% of those samples, and bearing in mind that's about 450 patients in our small study, which is much larger than our actual cohort, um, were out there with low levels. So we asked, where, do these, where are they all from? Who has got these patients that are doing liver function tests? Well, it's medicine, it's oncology, it's a lot of specialties, and I'll pick out surgery here, because that's a high one. So we thought, well, let's look in more detail. What about if we just go for the guys that have less than four grams? Where are they from? Well, it's quite a bit from hemato-oncology, some from intensive care, and you can see that surgery has almost disappeared because actually, if you have fluids when you're having an operation, it bobbles it about a bit, but it doesn't really lower it. And then you've got um, other things like general practice, nephrology, transplant, medicine, places we could actually go and say, do you know, we think this person might have something else, something like CVID maybe. We looked at GP samples, so that's primary care. No one in primary care really gets IV fluids with us. And there's a whole mixture of things, but tiredness, abdominal bloating, rather non-specific things. And you'll know from some of the recent work from um, Jordan Orange's group, that fatigue is a major thing, but fatigue wouldn't prompt a primary care physician to think of this diagnosis. But if there was some green writing at the bottom of the request form, it might just do so. I'm just going to give you one single case that I'm going to go through fairly quickly. So this is a 19-year-old who his mother was told his tongue is too big for his mouth and he just kept dribbling all the time. He had a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy aged four, three sets of grommets and a hearing aid, and a chronic cough since the age of four. 
sinusitis and a post-nasal drip. These might be familiar things. He had about 12 to 15 infections a year and lost about 50 to 60 days from school. He was sent home as his cough was annoying the class. Um, he coughed throughout the night and fell asleep during his exams. And in the last year before I saw him, had six respiratory tract infections and two pneumonia admissions. I said, when did you last feel well? Out of ten, ten being brilliant, zero being absolutely rubbish, <laughs> how do you feel? We worked out he'd had about 180 visits to his GP in 15 years, HIV tested, and in 2012 was found to have no antibodies. So I had the opportunity to pull his chest x-rays, and I'm just going to walk you through these quickly. So this is, this is in, in time from the earliest going on. So no active lung lesion is seen. Normal heart size. Lungs are clear. Normal heart size. Patchy airspace change at both bases. Maybe infection. Goes on. The appearance now looks like chronic changes should be considered. Now the patient presumably has bronchiectasis, which is scarring in the lungs. All the time that all those x-rays were taken, the calculated globulin was low. The answer was there the entire time. Mm -hmm. So just for this part, I think because it's so simple and because we're doing it already and because you don't actually need to spend money on this, you can find people out of liver function tests. It's easy, it's cheap, and it's underused. You'll find both primary and secondary antibody deficiency. And I would say that most, I think that's probably fair, most patients in our cohort are now discovered because of calculated globulin. And if it was a room like this, which it isn't because we're much smaller, um, each year I ask, can you put your hands up, please, if you were discovered by calculated globulin? And more and more and more hands go up in the room each year. So that's an automated comment across all of Wales for all of the labs doing liver function tests. And what we found is we actually need more staff because we've got more people, and we need more nurses, and we need more space because... It just finds them. So um, I'm going to hand back at this point to Charlotte. Thank you. So we've woven these together, and hopefully the weaving is going to work here. I think these are yours. <laughs> it's my slide, but he's going to talk first. We'll Go for it. No, no, you're, you're up. Um, we're going to talk about basic treatment, and then we're going to talk about things that may have to be done after that. So back to Stephen for a minute. <laughs> These are your slides. There's nothing quite like a well-woven set of slides, I find. Because <laughs> <laughs> we did this months in advance, as you've probably gathered. Um, so, therapy. I'm going to... Do you like the new infusion pump here, actually? That's, uh, <laughs> that's one you probably don't want to meet anytime soon. I'm going to touch on immunoglobulin antibiotics and vaccination <laughs> and uh, begin by saying that actually we think about intravenous and subcutaneous, but in fact there's much more than that. And you've heard about individuals and individualization and optimization, and I'd very much like to speak to that. So this lady has got a real problem on her hands. So many shoes and so little time. And uh, rather like the choices now, we need to think quite hard to get this right. So we have got intravenous and subcutaneous, but we've got weekly, we've got bi-weekly, we've got rapid push, we've got facilitated immunoglobulin. And I think in an absolutely delightful uh, collaboration and I'm going to, I know I'm going to lose half the room here, so I apologize <laughs> right away about that. But um, 
Christian Louboutin, as you know, does these brilliant shoes with the red bottoms. They're, they're not cheap. Um, but, so in collaboration with him, we worked out that, in fact, how does the immunoglobulin levels in blood change if you are an intravenous or subcutaneous? And you can see here that, as you know, if you have intravenous, you have a peak, and then it drops down, and then you have another treatment. If you're on subcutaneous, it's very stable. If you're on uh, facilitated, it comes up and meets the line and you have another treatment. And you can, if you look under the table, you'll probably see this straight away. So intravenous, you can just see it going up there. Facilitated is here. Biweekly is here. Weekly is here. And you know, fashion and immunology coming together. It's just, <laughs> just so delightful. <laughs> so obviously someone's got to go to the ball and choosing these things uh, is not straightforward and is a conversation between patients, doctors, nurses to try to get this right and you think is it at home, is it in hospital uh, I mean we have um, quite a few patients on intravenous at home in the UK so I'm kind of just comparing and contrasting practices a bit um, if you're having it uh, at home, how often should one have it? What about rapid push? Can you design a protocol that fits around your week? Facilitated in hospital or at home? All choices, all of a kind of picture that we've got to paint with all these different colors of these choices. And this is just a, uh, this is a painting from the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, and you can see a lot of colours will have to have been used to get this absolutely spot on uh, for this gentleman. That's about the medicine. And I've got a slide now from our senior nurse, Emily, who really brings the real life aspects to it as well. So the discussion, or as she puts it, translation of what I've said, um, uh, has to encompass all of these other aspects. So it may be about needles, it might be about appearance, it might be about travel, but it's all got to be in the mix. And very importantly, the options are not fixed. This needs review. It's like a cycle going round. Is it still the right thing? Does this still, you're, you're going to university. How are we gonna do this? It's all right to change, in fact, it's necessary to think about change. You almost have to think about whether the status quo is still right. I'm just going to touch on the profiles here and I, I'll not read all of these out, but for intravenous there are of course a bunch of different things which may make the decision swing towards an IV product. Or indeed a subcutaneous product but it is a little bit about perspective. It's about what is this decision for you? Sometimes um, subcutaneous seems entirely wrong. I had someone say to me, would I do my own plumbing? No, that's why I'm coming into hospital for you to do this for me. I thought, well, fair enough actually. Um, but other people will see it quite differently. So, just to say here, this is our own cohort in Wales, and you can see that there is a oh. chunk of IVs. Most people are on subcut, yeah, no. but some are on IV at home. And I'm just going to mention antibiotics because I think this is another area of individualization. And sometimes, because we have rare diseases, we have to pinch ideas and look to other disorders like, in this case, obstructive airways disease or it might be cystic fibrosis to see if we can learn things and here you can see that there is a difference with a prophylactic antibiotic called azithromycin in this setting and as has been mentioned and will be mentioned again at the meeting I think it's about individualization and grading antibiotics certainly in the UK probably most patients that I would have would have an antibiotic at home. That doesn't mean they're on it, but it just means 
it's available as a safety net. And that might be because with us, you can't get to see your GP straight, straight away, and you need to react more quickly. But there are lots of options here. Vaccination. This is, a, this is actually a nice study from Canada. And what they did was they vaccinated family members. And one set had a flu vaccination, and the other set had a control, which I think was hepatitis vaccination, which obviously would not help your flu. Um, and they found that there was a 59% effectiveness if you vaccinated children of families in preventing flu in the adults. So it's a kind of not just the patient, it's the patient and their family and their surroundings to think about. And just a kind of word about infection avoidance. Now, poor old piglet here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, bless. This is, of course, a balance needs to be struck. And one needs to be sensible and take care. But one can't quarantine or isolate uh, and move, uh, in particular, obviously, children out of socialization. So just to finish treatment, lots of choices. Understanding the difference between these options. And uh, you know, many thanks to Christian on that front. Um, individualization of both immunoglobulin and antibiotics. And you have to make sure that the glass slipper fits on the foot. This is very, very individual and it's gonna be different uh, for each person. I'm gonna switch back. Switch. <laughs> Not sure how this tag team is going, but I think it's working, yes? <laughs> okay. It's not boring. <laughs> okay. okay, so we, we know that gamma globulin is essential, antibiotics as needed, and I have to tell you, I think that's a very even perspective that you just heard about the sub-Q and the IV and the facilitated sub-Q and who and when and the flexibility. I think that was all just really exactly spot on as far as I'm concerned. So, but that does that does everything? Does that do everything that you need to have done? Well, that's the problem. Sometimes in hypogamma globulinemia, there are things that did not get finished, did not get done. One of them, um, Stephen just alluded to, which is the patient that came in the door a little bit too late. It's a bigger problem. This, for example, um, this is actually a very sad case. Um, every time I look at it, I remember the lovely lady who came to me. This was actually her first CT scan. And as you can see, yes, she was a smoker, but she was also 28 years old. So being a smoker, being 28, this was really pretty bad. So her lungs have what we call bronchiectasis, which means that the lining, the little lining, uh, portions of the bronchial tubes at the tips have become so swollen and so infected over time that she really had very bad lung function the day that I met her. So that is a complication, but that's a complication that's sort of due to the long-term infection problem and certainly could have been avoided. But there's other things that we understand really a heck of a lot less, let's be honest, which is that gamma globulin adds back that component that you're missing. The antibodies can be given almost to any level in the blood. But we are unfortunately are aware, and it's becoming increasingly aware, that gamma globulin does so much. And for about 50%, in my hands at least, 50% or so of everyone that I see, it probably is the only real answer that they need. But for everyone else, there are going to be a number of people who have autoimmunity, continuous gastrointestinal disease, continuous lung disease, um, a great deal of difficulty with uh, continued failure to thrive, uh, lymphadenopathy, the lymph glands are very big, the spleen is very big, and in particular, the lungs become extremely scarred, not necessarily due to chronic continuous infections. So CVID is, unfortunately, we're now that we're seeing patients that we knew so long ago, we are realizing that that's what we call the complications of this ailment. In my hands, as I said, they run the most of, of the patients that I see have more complex disease. I think that's true for referral centers. 
this was data that Helen Chapel from Oxford and I put together. I think some 25% or so had only infections in their past history, nothing else. But everybody else had had one or more additional issues. For example, autoimmunity or granulomatous involvement of the tissues. Granuloma, and I think Stephen's going to mention more about this as well. Granuloma is a normal lymphocyte component. It's a normal cell. And it's tried its absolute darndest to eat that bacteria and do everything it's supposed to do, but it's way too challenged. And it's part of an inflammatory little nodule called a granuloma. It's not necessarily a group of bad cells. It's cells that were over-challenged and just simply couldn't meet the situation. So these are the complications. And this, in this circumstance, again, what Stephen said is right. For this circumstance, we began to cherry pick and we began to look at our colleagues to get additional ideas about what other therapies might be used. So first of all, let's talk about autoimmunity. To me, it seems like the ultimate unfair thing that if you cannot make an antibody to tetanus, diphtheria, measles, mumps, rubella, chicken pox, or something along those lines, why on earth would your antibody-making cells suddenly start to make an antibody against your platelets? It's really unfair very unfair. Red cells, the same thing. If you go around the picture here, the pernicious anemia just mentioned ago, why on earth would your B cells, your antibody-making cells, suddenly take against the one thing which allows you to absorb vitamin B12, which is intrinsic factor? There's something really illogical about that, but it's a fact. When the immune system isn't handling the outside world, sometimes it turns against the inside world, and that's a big problem. So autoimmunity is probably one of the larger things that I see. This is uh, about 28% for me have autoimmune disease. One of my fellows just recently did a survey of the USID net registry, and it runs actually quite a bit lower, somewhere around 10%. And so that's the advantage of USID net, which is that what I see as a referral center is not necessarily what's the real story. The real story is probably somewhere around 10, 15% or something along those lines. So these are the types of, of autoimmune that you see. Mostly it's against the blood forming elements, in other words, the red cells, or especially the platelets, to some extent, both of them together, rarely the white blood cells called the neutrophils. And if you go around the list, things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and pernicious anemia certainly occur, but not to the extreme uh, um, number, I would say. For, for reasons that I, I, I honestly don't understand either, those patients who have autoimmunity are often those who are not having infections particularly. What they are having is they're oftentimes older. They are not children. Um, doesn't mean a person with CVID who can't have ITP as a child. No, but some of the older ones come in the door missed by the hematologist oftentimes because ITP is a very, very reasonably common disease anyway in young adults, and it's oftentimes missed. And this is a situation of that sort. This is actually a 46-year-old contractor who lives in Westchester County, um, which is the county just above New York City. And he was basically well, except that he had three episodes of hemolytic anemia, one after the other, fairly severe. Hematologist was totally stunned when, and, and by the way, the last one resulted in a splenectomy. Um, and then the last one, um, shortly thereafter, six months later, then this guy, developed an extremely severe pneumonia. As you can see, that blob over there on the chest is really a pneumonia. And on the CT scan, it's towards the end, you know, underneath the left lower lobe down there is also just nothing but one big pneumonia. And she was very surprised. And she then, I don't know why she did it, but she measured the immunoglobulins. It'd be really cool to look at the globulin fraction of this man, because I imagine it must have been horrible all along. And of course, he was astonishingly short on any kind of gamma globulin whatsoever. So this is the way that um, oftentimes a patient will be discovered late and partially due to just the autoimmunity, but no infections, curiously enough. He had no infection history whatsoever. So I've seen this really now quite a number of times. I mentioned thing about the lung. It's one thing to have bronchiectasis because there's been pneumonias and pneumonias and pneumonias that weren't treated. The other is, when lymphocytes suddenly say, oh, the lung is my home, I'm just going to go and live in that lung, why not? The lung isn't supposed to be a home for lymphocytes particularly. It's not a lymph node. 
And yet what can happen is lymphocytes go to the lung and then they take up residence and they begin to set up housekeeping. They begin to try to be a little bit of a lymph node right there in the lungs, which you're not supposed to be. And all those little nodules that you see are lymphoid aggregates, in some cases some, some other areas of fibrosis. So these are two patients of mine who have really interstitial lung disease, and one of them has also some granulomatous involvement. And so does gamma globulin help? No, unfortunately not. Does it mean we don't use plenty? Sure we do. But does it do anything to reverse this problem? No, it's a big problem. Um, and the same is true for the next one, which is gastrointestinal problems. Diarrhea is one thing, um, and having bacteria in the intestinal tract is one thing, but when all the lymphoid nodules that are supposed to line the intestinal tract and line a little bit flat heap up and make those little circular globules there, this is a patient that was referred to me from uh, Michigan who had lost somewhere around, I don't know, I, I keep thinking he's lost somewhere around 80 or 90 pounds because the intestinal tract is really sort of turned into a lymphoid organ. It's supposed to be absorbing nutrients. What is it doing trying to be a lymphoid organ here? And of course, the, the treatment there is as some very useful things can be done to get this under control. Um, the second picture there is a patient I knew for a very long period of time who had an inflammatory bowel disease, very much like Crohn's disease, actually. And so these are sort of the GI problems that occur. Does gamma globulin help? No, unfortunately not, not really. And so these are the things that become what we call the non-infectious complications. It doesn't mean that an infection didn't start the ball rolling downhill. It's just that it, the gamma globulin didn't seem to really help finish the process. If you look at the USID net statistics, um, lots and lots of gastrointestinal problems occur in people with low gamma globulins. And I guess that's not too surprising because as you were hearing a moment ago, the whole of the gastrointestinal tract is filled with normal lymphocytes. That's normal. There's bacteria at a mucosal surface. Having the immune system there is a normal event. That's normal. That's fine. The catch is when the lymphoid tract is really not making antibodies, specifically IgA, for example, or any of the others, it really can't seem to really have normal function in many cases. So the common things are common. You can see the commonest thing up there was actually reflux. Okay, well, reflux, whatever. Reflux can be found in your next door neighbor. You don't have to be immune deficient to have reflux, right? And that's true for several things on here as well. But inflammatory bowel disease that is really not infectious and not functional is something which is very common in CVID. This is one thing I meant a moment ago, and uh, this is uh, actually Charles Filion, who spent a uh, couple of years with me from Montreal. And if any of you want to go back to Montreal and see a very fine clinical immunologist, it's Dr. Filion. And this uh, hopefully will come out as a publication. We, we thought, and my, my, my view for so long has been, CVID is not IgG deficiency. It's more than that. In other words, having your IgG be a little bit low is not the same thing as having your A and your M and the other B cells not doing such a good job. And so we actually did a chart review, or uh, Charles did, and it turns out that the people who are IgG deficient only are actually not, I wouldn't say completely free, but very, very free from the complications that we see in CVID. And that's the other reason that I think it's important to get the diagnosis straight. If you have just your IgG low, you don't need your physician to be constantly worried about your enteropathy or your granulomatous lung disease or your splenomegaly. Chances are, frankly, you don't have it, and it's not going to develop. And that's what this slide says. There's really a C difference between the two diagnoses as far as we can tell. I think that slide is what that's for. Um, now, what are we going to do about it? And that's where uh, Stephen's going to tell you well, what are we going to do then? We have these inflammations. What are we going to do? Gamma globulin did not do the trick. Now what? Thank you. Um, I was going to concentrate just on two areas briefly. One was um, gut disease and uh, some of the treatments that are available and just highlight something that's on the horizon um, and why that might uh, also work. So, of course, we have to exclude infection. Um, Gluten-free diet, possibly, uh, to, to my mind, it's a very tiny number that really, I think, benefit from it. But then we have these steroids that are um, uh, 
metabolized on the first pass through the liver, so they have less effect on the rest of the body, but they treat the gut. Um, other things, anti-TNF agents have been used in some patients, and these newer monoclonal antibodies. I'm just going to mention this one. So, in a sense, to get inflammation, and as you saw in those beautiful pictures, with those kind of nodules of lymphocytes coming in that likely shouldn't be there. Here is a medicine uh, called vedolizumab, which has been uh, much more widely used by gastroenterologists than by immunologists, in fact. And what you have is um, my rather juvenile representation of T cells here as barracudas swimming into this inflamed gut. And uh, uh, rest assured, it gets more juvenile as the um, slides go on here. Uh, uh, and is there a way that we can stop these getting to the site of inflammation? Well, um, T cells find the gut using kind of molecular addresses, not dissimilar to this. So you're kind of posting those T cells into the gut. And the antibodies, vedolizumab, block the address. So literally, kind of tipex is out this. So the antibody stops those T cells finding the gut and therefore getting their survival signals uh, and causing inflammation. Uh, lots of experience in other diseases and sometimes we have to pinch those ideas and pinch those new treatments and see if they are potentially helpful in, in the settings that we encounter. Um, probably we need more information for this, but it's there on the horizon. I was going to touch on this non-infective lung disease, and it's got a terribly long and difficult to say name, which is summarized as GLILID, but granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease. And essentially, it's those cells coming into the lungs that should not be there. And what I wanted to do was talk you through an imaging modality. This is called FDG-PET, or fluorodeoxyglucose PET and CT. So what you have is a combination of CT showing you the structure of the lungs, and FDG-PET, which is glucose, which is labeled, showing you where it is being metabolized. And this is a, well, it's a pretty much normal scan, except for perhaps those in the front might be able to see there's a black dot up here. So this is not a CVID patient, this is just a, a scan that uh, uh, is normal for the rest of the body, but this is in fact a tumor. The brain is always black because we're using glucose in the brain. So to show you someone with CVID who has this glilid, so granulomas in the lung, and as it's rotating, you can perhaps see that the first message to me when I saw this scan with the radiologists was, this is not just in the lung. This is actually much more widespread, and those cells are turning over and turning over and trying to sort something out, which, which isn't really there. The good news was that um, uh, groups in the U.S. have looked at uh, using... Uh, medicine called rituximab, which actually kills B cells, which in this setting, because they're not working properly, you feel actually we've already got beautifully topped up with immunoglobulin. So taking these out if they are doing harm would be a less bad thing. So this uh, is a lovely lady who was then treated with rituximab and an immunosuppression called mycophenolate, and this is her before and this is her after. And you can see that pretty much all of that activity, the black fluorodeoxyglucose positive, has melted away. And uh, she remains well now, many, many, many months after that um, single treatment. And so we have some laboratory markers that we can use. And then some of the clustering where maybe a big spleen is a kind of think about the spleen, but not just the spleen, think about other things as well. Okay, I'm going to hand back. <laughs> Thank you. That's nice.
So I know this is a question that comes up a lot, inheritance and testing. And if you were here a few years ago, I think probably I might have said something very different from what I'm going to say today. I guess that's good, right? It's good to not be stuck on one point of view. This is why I think that it's good to keep an eye on the literature, but it's also good to keep an open mind about how things are moving along rather rapidly. I don't think that gene testing is for everyone, and you don't need it for a CVID diagnosis, and I think probably around, I don't know how many people in this room could have any benefit from it, but there are going to be patients who probably could benefit a lot by genetic studies, and I think those numbers will increase. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our experience from Mount Sinai and why it is that I've sort of gone down a whole nother pike. One of the things to mention is that up until, I would say, two or three years ago, the number of, dis of genes that have been located in people with CVID is very tiny. I have a slide that shows just exactly how many. It's really an infinitesimal number, actually. Um, for example, two of this and four of that and ten of the other, and that's worldwide. And you think, well, I'm not going to spend $1,000 or $2,000 or something like that for something which has been found in five other people in the United States, or for that example, 13 related people who live along the Danube River who have a gene called Icos. Right, if you lived around that area or if you related to one of those individuals, it's probably worth it. Other than that, I wouldn't want to pull out my checkbook for that. But, but things are changing. And so the genetics lab story is getting to be big. This, by the way, is not me. This is not my van here. Um, but I think it's actually hilarious. It, it was parked outside Lincoln Center and I got my husband to stop the car so I could rush out and take a photo. <laughs> I thought it was so hilarious. <laughs> I, I, I didn't go in that van, but I really, I would like to have gone into that van to see what the heck is going on here. I just think it's hilarious. So this is, I guess, for fraternities and all sorts of other reasons, but what, we, um, what we're now thinking about with CVID is that, no, it's not required for the diagnosis, and it's expensive, and for most people, 80% or better, you're not going to find a specific gene but, and by the way, nobody's gonna probably change their treatment. The things that Stephen was talking about in the immunoglobulin therapy and the antibiotics, all the basics are probably gonna change. It's not gonna make a huge difference in your life. But now, with new data, we have to understand there's a new chapter evolving here, and it might actually alter your management. So, we've been, for the last couple of years, doing a study called whole exome sequencing. And if you heard what Troy Torgerson was talking about this morning, we've done whole exome and whole genome as well. But we, we aren't doing everyone. We're doing those people that are actually having the more complicated diseases. In other words, the people who have infections only, who perhaps have some IgA retained in their blood, people whose IgM is a little bit higher. So what we've done is we've sort of circumscribed and tried to focus on the people that we thought we might have the most luck in. For one thing, I can't afford to do everybody. It's a study that I'm doing with Rockefeller, and we, we don't have an endless budget. It comes from the National Institutes of Health and something called a program project. And no, I can't test everybody, but I, I'm wanting to sort of like say who's the most useful for. So we started with those who have very, very low B cell numbers in the peripheral blood, 1% or less figuring that was going to be the most likely. In other words, something slightly different about those people, that's about 10% of patients. Obviously, we chose anyone who has more than one member in one family because clearly that shows you something genetic. And then those subjects who have this severe inflammatory disease that you just realize too much autoimmunity, the spleen is big, you have the granulomatous lung involvement, um, lymphoid infiltrates, lots of intestinal problems and that sort of thing. And oftentimes they go kind of as a package deal. That's another unfair thing. And those are the patients that I thought, oh gosh, I just need some clues here. So that's why we put them in. And then those subjects with very early onset, those who have a history going back two, three, five, eight years old, children more or less are the ones that we thought we might get the most benefit from. 
So, so let me go back. This, is, this looks like a hard slide, but it actually isn't. It tells you the migration of a B cell. And my, B cells actually have an astonishingly hard life. They, 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 many of them die. Almost all of them die on the way of their journey. 90% of them never make it out the other end because quality control said, you're no good, or you're autoimmune, forget it. Um, or they die because they don't get the right growth factors. They don't get the right stimulus in the bone marrow. They leave the bone marrow and they stumble into the wrong area of the body. And of course, they're slaughtered. So B cells have really a very, very long and hard life. To make it to a lymph node away from the bone marrow is, again, not, not simple. Lots of things have to happen between that point. And then finally, even after they go to the lymphocyte and then they meet a few things that tell them a few things they need to know, the T cell side and the macrophages, they meet an antigen they're supposed to go after. Even after that, then they have to grow up. It's like going to college, for goodness sakes. You know, you have to go to college and, and somehow get a diploma the diploma means that you graduate it, and there's a marker for that, by the way, and you turn into a cell called a plasma cell, which is like the tenured faculty of the, of the college, okay? And that's the tenured faculty, and those are the plasma cells. You can imagine, that's a long journey, isn't it? Okay, well, lots of accidents along the way. And the other thing to mention is there's an awful lot of additional interactors along the way, because all the neighborhood that has to be traveled through any of the insulting events that could occur, a lack of anything, any cell that didn't do its job along the way is going to mean that you do not get that functioning cell out the other end. And that's the lesson. So the final result is that out of 104 patients for 32 of the patients, which to me, if somebody had told me that I would show this slide two years ago, I probably would have flipped out because it's just been such an amazing event for us which is that out of this number of patients, for 34 people of this set, highly cherry-picked, I admit, you know, I think we know the gene, the causative gene. And I'm thinking, wow, that's kind of amazing news. Now, one of those genes called TASI, which is that 30, whatever that is, percent, that big orange thing, a lot of people don't use that diagnostically, and neither do I, um, but it is seemingly a player. And so if you don't think TASI and some immunologists are not very keen on that particular molecule, if you take it out, then we're down to 28% still out of the total. So there's a lot of unexpected genes. The other thing which we didn't realize is that a lot of these are one copy only. In other words, you don't have to have two copies from two parents. You can have one copy from one parent. And the other thing that's odd about it is that sometimes the parent can have the same gene but be perfectly okay. And of course, that seems very odd, but that's why this has been hiding all along and why these genes have been hiding, I would say. It's been an amazing revelation for me, and then you might end up thinking, well, what does that tell you? Well, for example, a few of these actually have pharmaceutical targets. In other words, they're genes that other workers in the world of immunology, especially in oncology, have always been interested in because they are growth factors. So an abnormality of growth factor might mean your B cell doesn't grow up, or it might mean that it's too overactive. The oncologists have some tricks to slow cells down. And so I think that, as Stephen said a moment ago, sometimes we need to get rid of all those bad autoimmune cells, and that's what rituximab is all about. But there's other tricks that other pharmaceutical companies are coming up with that also can be cherry-picked. And I would say about 10 to 15 percent of the patients, at least that I can see here, now have a pharmacologic tool that might be useful. I'm going to take that slide out. Now we're going to go back. I think Stephen's going to tell you a little bit about monitoring, and then we're going to have a little discussion about the remainder. But I think monitoring is next. Thank you. So. Monitoring is, uh, we, we had a, a screening group and a monitoring group set up which had about 13 European centers and it became very clear that in fact we weren't all doing the same thing but some of the things uh, were the same. So certainly clinical review, blood tests, things that you know about, lung function tests, microbiology, imaging I'm going to mention and then because I think I do like things that are simple. I'm going to mention another simple thing to you and see what you think. So uh, it's back, back to juvenile for the next slide. Um, this is a, 
It's nice because it was actually done in Los Angeles, Blade Runner. Takes you back a bit. But what they did was had these very enhanced eyes. And so one of the monitoring things that we've been wondering about is using MR scanning with something called a blade sequence. Uh, so tenuous though it seems, the link is there. Um, so there's no radiation, and it's not quite as good as CT, but almost as good. But one of the things that we're looking at is whether, in fact, using something called diffusion-weighted imaging, which I have to get radiologists to explain to me, um, is where potentially you can use it to find inflammation. Because if you have lots of cells in, it actually pushes the water molecules out, which means you have less um, signal from water molecules. So if there are lots of cells, it looks different to if you have normal tissue. Now, this is the, um, the lovely lady that you saw before. And these are the CT images. And you can see that this is before and this is after the treatment. The glowing red color is where glucose is being used. This is a really uh, active lymph node. It's gone here as well. These have gone on treatment. And what was nice, I, I, I'm sorry, this is small, but the message is straightforward, is that while you can decrease any individual node in terms of its glucose activity by maybe 80%, you don't do the same for structure because, of course, you still have a lymph node there. It's just that the activity and size has been, been decreased. So this might be about 40-something um, percent reduced, and this is about 77 percent reduced. So I was chatting to this lady um, in clinic, and uh, she said, yes, I've, I got so breathless that my husband, who works at the top of the house, works from home. I don't go up the stairs to talk to him anymore. I just ring him. And I thought, gosh, that's really not going up the stairs. And uh, so we got to talking. I said, oh, does your, um, do, you have, do you have a health tracker? She said, no, no, my son would never give his up. Um, but I do have a phone. And so I said, well, were you wearing it when we were treating you? And she said, yeah, I keep it on me all the time. And I said, well, would you be prepared to just share the files and the data from before your treatment and after your treatment? And she said, yeah, I'll just send this it down to you. Kind of cool. So yeah. what we did was essentially just took the most simple bit of data, which is steps it's per day. Cool. And we added it up to steps per week. And so this is her steps. And this is where we treated with rituximab. She has ongoing, actually very low level of mycophenolate. But, and this is, of course, anecdote. It's not really science. It's just one patient. But you can see that the steps changed. And she didn't know we were going to do this. We just chatted in clinic about it. And so when she came back, I said to her, so what about these steps? And she said, oh, I knew you were going to ask me that. So what I did was ran up all five flights of stairs in the car park so I could tell you about it. And I thought, wow, so you couldn't do that before. And she said, no, and I'm even walking my daughter to school. And then I walked back. And I thought, this, this is real. So we've just got a, a, a small um, grant to start a study, which is um, called the FITPAD study, or Fitness Trackers in Primary Antibody Deficiency. And we're going to try to see if this helps us in terms of both um, putting numbers to things like steps per day or stairs climbed, heart rate, sleep cycle. Once you start looking, these are actually tremendously sophisticated tools. You can do the number of floors climbed or measure sleep. So in sleep, you can measure how many times you wake at night. Now that might be because you're coughing at night it might be that, and you can see here in the red is when you're awake, and they have different ways of measuring this. And so you have a um, potential to look at before you start treatment and when you're on it. Does it make a big difference? If we change treatment for some reason, has it helped? What about wear off effect? Are you as good in the fourth week as you are in the first? How many steps? How many floors? How much sleep? Dose changes. Do infections make an impact? How long does an infection make an impact? So we thought, is this a simple way that we can kind of try to gather data 
and help us optimize things. Um, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to be very remiss if I don't say castles, dragons and rugby in a <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. We are almost to an end, but expectations, um, we're going to leave that a lot to Todd and to what you ask us tomorrow. We know you have these questions here, and we hope that those will come up tomorrow. We like to be as specific as we can, and we're going to make an attempt to do that tomorrow. But I thought I would tell you that the first patient with CVID was reported at the age of 35 at the Massachusetts General Hospital in 1953. And that was the first record of it. Afterwards, the same year, three additional publications came out. One of them I discovered was my father. So I was kind of stunned to realize that because under that circumstance, he recognized it in another circumstance entirely, which goes back to the idea of it's not like it's new. It's just that it's been there all the time. We just didn't see it. So what's happening now? Well, this is kind of the publication rate. And I went through and um, put some hallmark years here because each one of these is coupled with a specific new idea, a theme, a notion. And as you can see, 2017 looks a little bit left behind, but that's because it's only up until April of this year. And I'm sure it's going to catch up and it will be even more. Um, I do want to mention to have everyone here to remember to join USIDNet. I'm extremely keen to have everyone who is here who has CVID, who has a relative with CVID, make them join. Um, I think it's a very, very useful way to gather data and make us stay on target. The other thing is to kind of correct what we think, tell us what the problems are. You remember you do that if you're not at a one of the 45 major medical centers that are attached to USIDNet, you can do it through the EPHR. And I think that's really something that's very, very dear to our hearts. And this, of course, is Mount Sinai from the other side of the park. So now I'm going to ask uh, Todd, because to Todd has, T Todd is the expert here, to be honest with you. He, he can tell you the real facts, and that's why he's titled his session, The Real World. So first of all, I asked Todd for a couple of different reasons. One is that he is astonishingly healthy. He's fabulous. He's wonderful. He's very articulate. I've also known him since he was a teenager. So that's the other reason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Um, this is really new to me, everything about this. Uh, the, the convention, public speaking. And I just want to, before I make my presentation, I want to acknowledge every one here. You have all made an impact on my life, whether it's in the form of sharing, acquiring knowledge, or just support. I applaud you. And I think you should all give yourself a round of applause. Come on, don't be humble. Come on, don't be humble. I know you're all humble. Come on. Uh, excuse me one second. Oops. This is where sinus, chronic sinusitis meets, meets nerves. I need tissues. <laughs> Hi, Autumn, how are you? <laughs> this is going to sound a little lovely here. Excuse me. Chronic sinusitis. You know it well. Yep. <laughs> <clears throat> here you go, Charles. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> That's where height does you good. <laughs> Honey, you think I can do this? Yeah, you got this. Are you sure? You got this. I don't know. I don't know. I need help. Inspire me, Addy, like I you didn't, always do. I didn't, oh. I didn't tell you. Right. Todd, Todd will tell you. Maybe he'll tell you. He does strongman contests, so his, uh, his, his abilities are not to be challenged. <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh, baby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, she taught me that, by the way. <laughs> That's my wife, Charlene. 
this is great. The name of my presentation is the real world. As in, get with the real world, Todd. Get with the real world. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow CBID people, I apologize if I just startled you there, um, but that is my dad. My dad was a boss. He was a defense contractor manufacturing army telephones and switchboards. I used to joke with my dad. I said, Dad, the telephones that you make, are those the ones that go <laughs> and worry like mayday, mayday? They never worked. But actually, they were very sophisticated. TA-312s and SB-22s. Ask me how they work. I have no idea. No idea. And you know what? That probably highlights something about my relationship with my father. He would say, get with the real world, because he knew, he knew that I was somewhat a slacker delusional, and maybe even a goofball. And he would say, get with the real world talk, because he knew, he knew. So I need to take you back. I'm 11 years old. I got three words for you. Sports, sports, and sports. Baseball, football, basketball, bowling. At the age of 11, I was invited to bowl on the professional tour. Look at that form. Pretty good, right? <laughs> this is no lie. Madison Square Garden, they had a stop. I'm 11 years old. I'm the best bowler in the region. They said, come, bowl. So it was clear. Now, a lot of 11-year-olds I know are thinking the same way. I'm going to be a professional athlete. In my case, at least maybe I had some data. <laughs> I'm going to fast forward a year later, age of 12. This is going to sound familiar. Ear infection. Now, I've had ear infections before, age 12, maybe once or twice a year. Really no big deal. I met a couple days off from school, which I liked. Not a good student. Didn't really like school. Sports, yeah. School, not so much. Evolves into pneumonia, then double pneumonia, bacterial and viral. 106 fever. I cannot breathe. I cannot breathe, ladies and gentlemen. I am dying here. I can feel it right now. <sighs> Rush to the hospital. I'm now the boy in the bubble, except not the John Travolta version, romantic Hollywood movie. I'm in an oxygen tent for at least three days. A week later, I'm discharged. I don't recollect the medicine that they gave me, but I'm home now, but not really getting better. Fatigued, tired, definitely sickly. Something's wrong. A couple of months later, no school, still no school. A couple of months later, finally, clinic, Sloan Kettering. Pioneer Dr. Robert Good, pioneer in rare immune deficient diseases, diagnosis. And sure enough, here it comes. I'm diagnosed with, very tough to pronounce, hypogammaglobulinemia. And I think it highlights something for me because it was so tough to pronounce that maybe there was a denial component because I was just so fearful to say what I had. Thank God for CVID. Makes it easier. But the truth is, well, the truth is my wife can't pronounce it. <laughs> my daughter can barely pronounce it. My friends forget about it. So maybe that, again, is an example. Honey, how do you say it? Hypogammaglobulinemia. All right, not bad, not bad. <laughs> Total game changer now. No more sports. Uh, my equilibrium is a little off there as I'm tilting here. Um, no more sports. No continuity. Missing out on school. Homework, forget about it. 
Grades, terrible. And sprinkling inadequacy and shame. This is all the beginning stages of this immune deficiency. My father would say, though, get with the real world, Todd. Get with the real world. Because he knew. He knew that I was a path of least resistance person or child. And he knew something else. I would play all these cards, whether it was the sick card, the victim card, the quit card. That was a biggie, the quit card. Anything I undertook, anything, I quit. I have a disease, I'm sick. I can't do it. Whether it was piano lessons or playing with friends, the minute maybe things weren't on my terms, I quit, I have a disease. Very easy, very easy. And the truth is, I really didn't feel that sick. But I wouldn't manipulate, boy. Ooh, and he knew, and he knew. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Barely graduate high school. And I'm going to piggyback. Because I didn't share with you the fact that I'm getting gamma globulin injections now. Once a week. Very painful. Fierce needles. Big needles. Fierce. Fierce substance. Pain. I mean excruciating. Yeah, I would suck it up and say, I can take this. I can do this. But as I've been doing research for my presentation, I realized something important. And whether it's needles, intramuscular, or blood work, nobody likes getting pricked. Nobody. Oh, I love getting pricked. I love it so much. Never heard that once. <laughs> Gamma globulin injection. Gamma globulin injection. Intramuscular. Something else is happening, though. Something else. I'm growing. I'm growing. It maybe ties in with the fact that medicine is getting better. So instead of intramuscular, I'm now getting boatloads of gamma globulin infusion style once a month. Innovative. But that's just coincidence as far as my height is concerned. I have a mother who's like 5'11", okay? My father's 5'9", think of those optics. Um, and truthfully, I was, I was still scared. 5'9", 6'5", now, by the time I barely graduated high school. Still afraid, still intimidated by my dad. So now what? I'm 6'5", 170 pounds. SAT's terrible. Grade's terrible. Next step. What am I going to do? Well, I think I'm going to go to a local junior college. And I'm 6'5", so I'm thinking basketball. Right? Makes sense. Well, it really doesn't. But it kind of does when you're delusional. <laughs> so I try out for this team. I get cut. I mean, I get cut right away. I have no idea about conditioning. Lung capacity is terrible. I'm tripping over the lines. Drills, I mean, think about the name of the drill. Suicides. You know, killers. I mean, I don't even try. I mean, I know this is not going to be good. So what do I do now? I get cut. Well, I kind of gave you a preview. I quit school. Because I quit. Next thing I do is figure out what next. I'm floating. I'm 19 years old. Easy fit. And that is, I'm going to go work for my father. I'm going to whip out my business card. Here it comes. My job title, the boss's son. And boy, and boy, did I take advantage. One of the characteristics that I love in people, if they are foxhole worthy, if you would want them in a foxhole, definitely would not want me six foot seven Todd in a foxhole. I mean, think about that. that. I mean, Private Schwartzman, get your head down. Private Schwartzman, get your head down. It is down. I'm like, I'm six seven. I can't, I can't move. I'm like... <laughs> My father gave me a written warning of termination. That's how bad an employee I was. <laughs> if I had that document, I would frame it today. So proud. And the reason why is 10 minute breaks. I wanted to show off my basketball ability to the stockroom people. 10 minute break. So I take them out to the local basketball court around near the factory. It's a true story. 
it becomes 45 minutes <laughs> instead of 10. And I'm like, yeah, boom, boom. My father finds out, and sure enough, but still playing basketball, still playing, getting better, lung capacity improving, things are changing a little bit. Maybe, I don't know. Playing basketball in New Jersey, local JCC, assistant coach for Jersey City State College noticing me play. And he asked me, Todd, would you be interested in a tryout? And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> what, me? Todd Schwartzman, sickly kid, trying out for an elite program, basketball program? I jump at the chance. And sure enough, here I come. I see these amazing athletes, specimens, jumping out of the gym, talking trash, intimidating. And here I go, I try out. And I am horrible! I'm horrible! <laughs> Tripping over the lines, I'm spazzing, I don't know, I can't make a layup or nothing. And I'm thinking, well, good old fashioned try. So the coaches convene and they escort me on campus. On campus. They're showing me the dorms, the bursar's <laughs> office, the student union, the academic buildings. They're saying, Todd, if you come here, we'll pay for tuition. <laughs> They're recruiting me. It makes no sense. <laughs> so sure enough, I go for it. I need to introduce you to my new father figure, Coach Charlie Brown. The one and only. I know what you're thinking. Yes, the one and only Charlie Brown. Legend in Jersey City. Teacher. African-American championed the inner city youth. He gave me clear expectation. He gave me fierce praise and constructive, tough criticism. And I needed that desperately. So, for the first time in my life, I make two conscious decisions. That is, I'm going to work my tail off. This is my last chance to prove to my father, to me, to coach that I can do this. And I'm not going to tell them about my illness, my disease. And it wasn't so much about even playing field. And it wasn't so much about wanting pity. It was more about 1983. AIDS was in the conversation. And the stigma of AIDS, and I want to be really sensitive about this because as I was doing research, I just want to be sensitive to the the AIDS community, if you will. And that was a big deal. Didn't want any thoughts trickling in. So freshman year, here we go. I'm all in. I'm not that good. Team's really good, but I'm getting time. I'm spelling the starting center for about 10 minutes a game, working my tail off, and sure enough, end of the year, my teammates award me something, the Mr. Hustle Award. I am like, wow, what a sense of accomplishment. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Just like you guys here, you all are doing it. So that summer, I decided I'm going to work doubly, triply hard. I'm going to jump rope every day. Oh, there's a chronic sinusitis, excuse me. I'm going to run sprints, shoot hoops every day that summer. Work my tail off. Sophomore season starts. We are fantastic. We lead the country in offense. We're ranked top 10 nationally. I am the starting center. Me. I am the starting center. We make it to the NCAA tournament. And we advance all the way to the Final Four. And I give this team so much credit that beat us by two, two points, the eventual national champions. Because they were so good. They never played a team as tough as we were all year. They were undefeated. And yet, they didn't implode. When the chips were down, they didn't implode and they still beat us by two. They faced the adversity. 
They rose up and they still won. They could have easily implode. And I give him so much credit for that. My number one fan this whole time was my dad. Was my dad. Buying newspapers 30 at a time. Paying for fellow teammates' parents' airfares who couldn't afford. He would sit me down because I was so worried and fearful. Remember, this ties into my illness about the inadequacy. I'm not supposed to be this guy. Dad, what if I don't do this? What if I don't do it? And he would say, don't worry. Don't worry. He taught me unconditional love. He wasn't jealous about my coach, my new father figure. He just wanted me to be happy. Senior year, I make captain. I'm captain. Jersey City State College. I make Jewish All-American. <laughs> and I like the joke, eh, there's only seven of us playing at the time. But I still made it. <laughs> Graduate. <laughs> Bachelor of Science, Business Marketing. I got an education. I got a, bus I got a business degree. College. Now what? Sign a professional contract play overseas in Israel. I'm a professional athlete. Can you believe it? 11-year-old Todd. Professional athlete. That's his real world. Unbelievable. And I do something for the first time after going overseas that I haven't done in a long time. Is that is I quit. I quit. I miss the States terribly. You sprinkle in a little sniper fire from the Golan Heights, and you know what? I'm out of there. <laughs> I get home, I see my dad. I say, Dad, I think I'm ready to hang it up. He gives me a look that I have not seen in a long time as well. That look of disapproval and disappointment. And before he can get a word in edgewise, I said, Dad! Get with the real world. Get with the real world, Dad. Thank you so much. I look forward to meeting as many as I can. Thank you so much.